kids, do you have rules you have to follow? Like no talking when the teacher is talking? Or no dessert until you eat your dinner? Or no playing until your homework is done? What happens when you break those rules? Do you get in big trouble? Well, in this lesson, we're going to talk about the very first time anyone broke a rule. Their names were Adam and Eve, and they were the first people to ever live. God put Adam in the garden and gave him one simple rule. God put Adam in a place named the Garden of Eden. He had him there so he could take care of it. In the garden, there were a bunch of trees that made yummy fruit that Adam could eat. But there was one tree called the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil. God told Adam to never eat from this tree. Things were going pretty well, but Adam was lonely, so God gave him a wife. God made Eve so Adam wouldn't be alone anymore. God made Eve out of one of Adam's ribs while he was asleep. That seems kind of weird, but God knew what he was doing. Adam and Eve lived happily in the garden and followed God's one simple rule. Well, at first they did anyway. The serpent tricked Adam and Eve into eating from the tree. One of the animals in the garden, the serpent, tricked Adam and Eve into breaking God's one rule. They ate the fruit that they were told not to eat. And when they did, they realized that they had sinned. They were so ashamed that they ran away and hid from God. When God found out what they have done, he knew he had to punish them. So he kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. Sometimes we want to hide from God when we make the wrong choice. Kids, when we break the rules, sometimes we want to run from God, too. We don't want to see how we hurt his feelings, and we don't want to be punished. But God doesn't punish us to be mean. He does it to teach us a lesson and to keep us safe. In fact, he knows we're going to break the rules. That's why he sent Jesus, to forgive us. So don't run away. Remember that he will forgive you and that he loves you. And show God you love him by following his rules in the future. Memory verse. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. So kids, remember, next time you talk in class or refuse to eat your vegetables, remember the story of Adam and Eve. Try your hardest not to break the rules. But even if you do, remember, God will forgive you. Hey kids and parents, if you want to learn more about obedience or what is sin, Check out the links below. neighbor has a medium-sized front yard and one day I noticed their son was out trying to fly a kite. He would run for a little bit and the kite would go up just a couple of feet and then just kind of nosedive and this happened over and over and over and I noticed on the bottom of his kite there was no tail. So I found an old towel and ripped it into strips, made a tail for him, put it in my pocket and went over to see how he was doing. We talked for a bit. He explained that he had never flown a kite before, but he happened to find this one in the garage. It had never been used, so we opened, put it together. 
but he wasn't having much luck, he said. And I noticed on the bottom of the kite there was something attached. I looked a little closer, and it was a rolled-up strip of plastic in a rubber band. And it occurred to me this was the tail that he just wasn't aware of. He had not seen a kite before. So I suggested, why don't you take the rubber band off that unroll that thing and see what happens. So he did, and his first pass through the yard, and that thing went straight up into the air, and he was having a ball with this kite. Now, he could have gotten real stubborn and decided, ah, he's an old guy, doesn't know what he's talking about. But he submitted his control of the situation to me, and I gave him a suggestion, and it panned out great. Control is a real big deal for us. We like to feel like we're to some degree in control of our lives. All it takes is a good crisis for us to find out how very little control we actually have. Most generations that are alive today tend to identify themselves in terms of a shared crisis. For example, my parents' generation, their crisis was the bombing of Pearl Harbor. For my generation, it was the Kennedy assassination. Another generation was 9-11. One day, it may be the COVID crisis. A crisis that we share that helps us identify with each other. And those crises remind us we don't have the kind of control over our lives that we once thought we did. On his way through Dallas the day that Kennedy was assassinated, he had a speech with him that he was planning to give, never wound up giving it. But in the speech was a segment from the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a very well-known piece from chapter 3. It begins, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. And it goes on for several verses. A time for this and a time for that. Opposites. Back in the 60s, a British invasion group called The Birds had a huge hit with the song Turn, Turn, Turn. And the words are basically taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In Kennedy's speech that included a time for this and a time for that, that entire poem. Perhaps he was reminding people that he was speaking to how important it was to do things in a timely way, not to let the moment slip away. As if people have the opportunity to choose time The context of Ecclesiastes and the whole book reminds us time is not ours to do with as we choose. Time is God's and things happen according to his timetable, his sovereign control. I mention that not to call attention to the idea that we ought to blame God for the tragic assassination of Kennedy but just to remind us that in spite of the way this verse is sometimes used, we are not as much in control as we think, and there is a limit to human freedom. Every day, we face the possibility of a disaster, partly because we live in a fallen world, partly because this rebellious nature in us partly because there are demonic forces in the supernatural at work all the time, we don't know from day to day. And so we are not completely free to choose whatever we want to do. But after that poem, a time for this and a time for that, there is this sentence. God has set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. 
He has placed eternity in our hearts. This desire to know what's going to happen, to have some idea what the future is going to bring, to know that we can have an effect now that will have a positive effect in the future. God has planted that in our hearts. And yet, we have very little control over the future or the positive effect that we can have. So there's this tension. God's in control. And yet he has set eternity in our hearts in this longing to not only know what the future has, but the chance we have to impact it. This tension. God's in control. We want to do something. God's in control. We want to do something. Into the middle of this tension steps Jesus. He is God, which means he is sovereign Lord. And yet at the same time, by taking on our humanity, by becoming a human being, he stepped into our situation with this longing to make a difference. Because he was God, he could make a difference. But because he's human, he was subjected to the same kind of limitations that we experience. Jesus invites us, instead of trying to control our lives and bumping into God's sovereignty, he invites us to submit to him, to take the things we want to have control over and submit them to him, and that by living in him and with him, we find purpose and meaning and hope that is more than just God sovereignly imposing things and our longing to make a difference. Now we find out what it means to make a difference God's way. We don't have the wisdom and the foresight and the capacity to control our lives well. We weren't designed to control our lives, but to submit control to him. One commentator says this, Vigilance to do what we can and trust in God to make sense of circumstances beyond our control. These are the responses that help keep us sane in a world that's gone crazy. There's a poem that has become more famous in the 19th and 20th centuries, even in the 21st century. There was even a movie by this title. The poem is Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. There's a man who insists on control of his life. And yet, William Ernest Henley had spent most of his life ill, suffering from the after effects of tuberculosis when he was young. At one point in his mid-50s, he had a fall out of a carriage and the tuberculosis resurged and eventually killed him. So he doesn't have the kind of control that this poem talks about. We realize that life brings challenges to every single human being. And for those who follow Jesus, there are things in this life that call for the very, very best from us. 
we do realize that our best efforts are still a gift from God. He plants in us the capacity to give back to Him our very best. And when we give it to Him, He takes it and uses it and accomplishes incredibly good things that we could never do in our own strength. But it begins with submitting it to Him. Someone wrote a Christian response to Invictus. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright is the sun from pole to pole. I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since he's the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him. And he's the aid that, in spite diminished of the years, keeps and shall keep me unafraid. It matters not, though straight the gate, he cleared the punishments from the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. Let's pray together. How we long to have a measure of control over life. But so much of life doesn't allow it. Please grant us the grace, Lord, to surrender, to yield, to give you rule and reign over our lives so that we can use the time and energy and goals that have been placed into our keeping and use them for the very best. Our yielding calls out the very best from us so that we can be, as one writer calls it, our utmost for your highest. Thank you for loving us as we are, guiding us through those things that we can't control, bringing the best from us and using us for the good of others and your glory even into eternity. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.